Hello and welcome back to a chapter a day where a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and the imagination at play. My name is Miss Petals and welcome back to another installment of Fahrenheit 451. This program was sponsored by the Seeds of Harvest Library, located 4121 Cleveland Street, Gary, Indiana, inside Market City. Friday and Sunday, 10.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Saturday, 10.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. They do accept donations, hardcovers only, please, and you can follow them on social media. Well, welcome back, you all. I'm sorry how last week ended with the camera going out. Turns out I had to go and take it back because I think the problem was the camera, not my computer. So today I am using my phone as a webcam and I'm using this thing called Droid Cam. I got a lot of, there was a lot of good reviews, so I'm giving it a try. So far, it's working great, and I pray that it'll continue while the reading is being read. If not, I do apologize, and I am sorry if it seems like uh, the stream is lagging, but hey, that's technology for you. So. so, in review, we learned about Montag and how he actually has been hiding books in his house for a while now it's not just that one he's stolen and he tells his wife Mildred about it and she seems like a scatterbrain to me y'all but like I said she's like an addict to me like she has the itch for wanting to look at screens all the time and the screen and she wants she's addicted to and wants the family which is the program that she is involved with and is really addicted to we also found out about a man named Faber who used to be a English professor but of course his job was no longer needed because of now the world that they're living in no longer requires books. They think books are useless, uh, brings arguments, uh, outside thinking, which is frowned upon in this world. And thus we left Montag visiting Faber. I also want to pose a question to you all. Um, I've been thinking about this book and I've been thinking about Mildred and what we read about Montag saying what he was thinking that when she overdosed on the sleeping pills and she, they uh, took what he calls the snake, put that tunnel in her, the, the snake into her body and pumped out all the poison and then they put new blood and new and a, like new new things to go into the body. I know I know I'm being but did it change her? What was Mildred like before that? Why did she overdose on the sleeping pills? Me personally, I do believe it was on purpose. And something must have triggered her or something must have made her think because, you know, in this world, thinking is what they consider dangerous or uh, the cause of all human wrong. But is it? So we're going to continue from where we started off last time. And we're only for an hour. <laughs> Mm. Faber sniffed the book now the book in review for those of you just coming in the book that Monte brought to Faber was the Holy Bible 
Do you know that books smell like nutmeg or some spice from a foreign land? I loved to smell them when I was a boy. Lord, there were a lot of lovely books once before we let them go. Faber turned the pages. Mr. Montag, you are looking at a coward. I saw the way things were going a long time back. I said nothing. I'm one of the innocents who could have spoken up and out when no one would listen to the guilty. But I did not speak and thus became guilty myself. And when finally they set the structure to burn the books using the firemen, I grunted a few times and subsided, for there were no other grunting or yelling with me. By then, now it's too late. Faber closed the Bible. Well, suppose you tell me why you came here. Nobody listens anymore. I can't talk to the walls because they're yelling at me. I can't talk to my wife. She listens to the walls. I just want someone to hear what I have to say. And maybe if I talk long enough, it'll make sense. I want you to teach me to understand what I read. Faber examined Montag's thin, blue-jowled face. How did you get shaken up? What knocked the torch out of your hands? I don't know. We have everything we need to be happy, but we aren't happy. Something's missing. I looked around. The only thing I positively knew was gone, was the books. I'd burned in 10 or 12 years, so I thought books might help. You're a hopeless romantic, said Faber. It would be funny if it were not serious. It's not books you need. It's some of the things that once were in books. The same things could be in the parlor families today. The same infinite detail and awareness could be projected through the radios and telev televisors, but are not. No, no, it's not books at all you're looking for. Take it where you can find it. In old phonograph records, old motion pictures, and in old friends. Look for it in nature and look for it in yourself. Books were only one type of receptacle where we stored a lot of things we were afraid we might forget. There is nothing magical in them at all. The magic is only in what books say, how they stitch the patches of the universe together into one garment for us. Of course you couldn't know this, of course. You still can't understand what I mean when I say all this. You are intuitively right. That's what counts. Three things are missing. One, do you know why books such as this are so important? Because they have quality. And what does the word quality mean? To me, it means texture. This book has pores. It has features. This book can go under the microscope. You'd find life under the glass, streaming past in infinite profusion. The more pores, the more truthfully recorded details of life per square inch you can get on a sheet of paper. The more literary you are. That's my definition anyway. Telling detail, fresh detail. The good writers touch life often. The mediocre ones run a quick hand over her. The bad ones rape her and leave her for the flies. 
So now do you see why books are hated and feared? They show the pores in the face of life. The comfortable people want only wax moon faces, poreless, hairless, expressionless. We are living in a time when flowers are trying to live on flowers instead of growing on good rain and black, fl black loam. Even fireworks for all their prettiness come from the chemistry of the earth. Yet somehow we think we can grow feeding on flowers and fireworks without completing the cycle back to reality. Do you know the legend of Hercules and Antaeus, the giant wrestler, whose strength was incredible so long as he stood firmly on the earth? But when he was held rootless in midair by Hercules, he perished easily. If there isn't something in that legend for us today, in this city, in our time, then I am completely insane. Well, there we have it. The first thing I said we needed. Quality, texture of information. And the second? Leisure. Oh, but we've plenty of off hours. Off hours, yes. But time to think. If you're not driving a hundred miles an hour at a clip where you can't think of anything else but the danger, then you're playing some game or sitting in some room where you can't argue with the four wall televisor. Why? The televisor is real. It is immediate. It has dimension. It tells you what to think and blasts it in. It must be right. It seems so right. It rushes you on so quickly to its own conclusions. Your mind hasn't time to protest. What nonsense. Only the family is people. I beg pardon? My wife says books aren't real. Thank God for that. You can shut them say hold on a moment you play god to it but who has ever torn himself from the claw that encloses you when you drop a seed in a tv parlor it grows you and any shape it wishes it is an environment as real as the world it becomes and is the truth Books can be beaten down with reason. But with all my knowledge and skepticism, I have never been able to argue with a 100-piece symphony orchestra, full color, three dimensions, and being in a part of those incredible parlors. As you see, my parlor is nothing but four plaster walls. And here, he held out two small rub rubber plugs for my ears when I ride the subway jets. Denim's dentrifice. They toil not, neither do they spin, said Montag's eyes shut. Where do we go from here? Would books help us? Only if the third necessary thing could be given us. Number one, as I said, quality of information. Number two, leisure to, to digest it. And number three, the right to carry out actions based on what we learn from the interaction of the first two. And I hardly think a very old man and a fireman turned sour could do much this late in the game. I can get books. You're running a risk. That's good. That's the good part of dying. When you've nothing to lose, you run any risk you want. There, you've said an interesting thing, laughed Faber, without having read it, having read it. Are things like that in books? But it came off the top of my mind. All the better. 
You didn't fancy it up for me or anyone, even yourself. Montag leaned forward. This afternoon, I thought that if it turned out that books were worthwhile, we might get a press and print some extra copies. We? You and I. Oh, no, Faber sat up. But let me tell you my plan. If you insist on telling me, I must ask you to leave. But aren't you interested? Not if you start talking the sort of talk that might get me burnt for my trouble. The only way I could possibly listen to you would be if somehow the fireman's structure itself could be burnt. Now, if you suggest that we print extra books and arrange to have them hidden in firemen's houses all over the country so that seeds of suspicion would be sown among those arsonists, bravo, I say. Plant the books, turn in an alarm, and see the firemen's houses burn. Is that what you mean? Faber raised his brow and looked at Montag as if he were seeing a new man. I was joking. If you thought it would be a plan worth trying, I'd have to take your word. It would help. You can't guarantee things like that. After all, when we had all the books we needed, we still insisted on finding the highest cliff to jump off. But we do need a breather. We do need knowledge. And perhaps in a thousand years, we might pick smaller cliffs to jump off. The books are to remind us what asses and fools we were. Well, we are. There, Caesar's Praetorian Guard, whispering as the parade roars down the avenue, Remember, Caesar, thou art mortal. Most of us can't rush around, talk to everyone, know all the cities of the world. We haven't time, money, or that many friends. The things you're looking for, Montag, are in the world, but the only way the average chap will ever see 99% of them is in a book. Don't ask for guarantees and don't look to be saved in any one thing, person, machine, or library. Do your own bit of saving and if you drown, at least die knowing you were headed for shore. Faber got up and began to pace the room. Well, asked Montag, you're absolutely serious. Absolutely. It's an insidious plan, if I do say so myself, Faber glanced, never the, nervously at his bedroom door. To see the firehouses burn across the land, destroyed as hotbeds of treason, the salamander devours his tail. Oh, God. I have a list of firemen's residents everywhere with some sort of underground can't trust people that's the dirty part you and I and who else will set the fires aren't there professors like yourself former writers historians linguists dead or ancient the older the better they'll go unnoticed you know dozens admit it Oh, there are many actors alone who haven't acted Pirandello or Shaw or Shakespeare for years because their plays are too aware of the world. We could use their anger, and we could use the honest rage of those historians who haven't written a line for 40 years. True, we might form classes in thinking and reading. Yes! But that would just nibble the edges. The whole culture shot through. The skeleton needs melting and reshaping. Good God, it isn't as simple as just picking up a book you laid down half a century ago. Remember, the firemen are rarely necessary. The public itself stopped reading of its own accord. You firemen provide a circus now and then at which buildings are set off and crowds gather for the pretty blaze. 
but it's a small sideshow indeed and hardly necessary to keep things in line. So few want to be rebels anymore. And out of those few, most like myself, scare easily. Can you dance faster when the white clown shout louder than Miss than Mr. Gimmick and the parlor families? If you can, if you can, you'll win your way, Montag. In any event, you're a fool. People are having fun. Committing suicide? Murdering? A bomber fight had been moving east all the time. They talked, and only now did the two men stop and listen, feeling the great jet sound tremble inside themselves. There's some of it in all of us. Oh, excuse me. Missed the page. Patience, Montag. Let the war turn off the families. Our civil... Our civilization is flinging itself to pieces. Stand back from the centrifuge. There has to be someone ready when it blows up. What? Men quoting Milton? Saying I remember Sophocles? Reminding the survivors that man has his good side too? They will only gather up their stones to hurl at each other, Montag. Go home. Go to bed. Why waste your final hours racing about your cage, denying you're a squirrel? Then you don't care anymore. I care so much I, I'm sick. And you won't help me. Good night. Good night. Montag's hands picked up the Bible. He saw what his hands had done, and he looked surprised. Would you like to own this? Faber said, I'd give my right arm. Montag stood there and waited for the next thing to happen. His hands, by themselves, like two men working together, began to rip the pages from the book. The hands tore the fly leaf and then the first and then the second page. Idiot, what are you doing? Faber sprang up as if he had been struck. He fell against Montag. Montag warded him off and let his hands continue. Six more pages fell to the floor. He picked them up and wadded the paper under Faber's gaze. Don't, oh don't, said the old man. Who can stop me? I'm a fireman. I can burn you. The old man stood looking at him. You wouldn't. I could. The book. Don't tear it anymore. Faber sank into a chair, his face very white, his mouth trembling. Don't make me feel any more. I'm tired. What do you want? I need you to teach me. All right, all right. Montag put the book down. He began to unwad the crumpled paper and flatten it out as the old man watched tiredly. Faber shook his head as if he were waking up. Montag, have you any money? Some. Four, five hundred dollars. Why? Bring it. I know a man who printed our college paper half a century ago. That was the year I came to class at the start of the new semester and found only one student to sign up for drama from Eschelius, excuse me, to O'Neill. You see how like a beautiful statue of ice it was, a melting in the sun. I remember the newspapers dying like huge moths. No one wanted them back. No one missed them. And then the government, seeing how advent advantageous it was to have people reading only about passionate lips and the fists in the stomach, circled the situation with your fire eaters. So Montag, there's this unemployed printer. 
We might start a few books and wait on the war to break the pattern and give us the push we need. A few bombs and the families in the walls of all the houses like Harlequin, rats will shut up. In the silence, our stage whisper might carry. They both stood looking at the book on the table. I've tried to remember, said Montague, but hell, it's gone when I turn my head. God, how I want something to say to the captain. He's read enough so he has all the answers, or seems to have. His voice is like butter. I'm afraid he'll talk me back the way I was. Only a week ago, pumping a kerosene hose. I thought, God, what fun. The old man nodded. Those who don't build must burn. It's as old as history and juvenile delinquents. So that's what I am. There's some of it in all of us. Montag moved toward the front door. Can you help me in any way tonight with the fire, Captain? I need an umbrella to keep off the rain. I'm so damned afraid. I'll drown if he gets me again. The old man said nothing, but glanced once more nervously at his bedroom. Montag caught the glance. Well... The old man took a deep breath, held it, and let it out. He took another, eyes closed, his mouth tight, and at last exhaled. Montag. The old man turned at last and said, Come along. I would actually have let you walk right out of my house. I am a cowardly old fool. Faber opened the bedroom door and led Montag into a small chamber where stood a table upon which a number of metal tools lay among a welter of microscopic wire hairs, tiny coils, bobbins, and crystals. What's this? asked Montag. Proof of my terrible cowardice. I've lived alone so many years, throwing images on walls with my imagination, fiddling with electronics, radio transmission has been my hobby. My cowardice is of such a passion, complementing the revolutionary spirit that lives in its shadow. I was forced to design this. He picked up a small green metal object, no larger than a twenty-two caliber bullet. I paid for all this. How? Playing the stock market, of course. The last refuge in the world for the dangerous intellectual out of a job. Well, I played the market and built all this and I've waited. I've waited trembling half a lifetime for someone to speak to me. I dared speak to no one. That day in the park when we sat together, I knew that someday you might drop by with fire or friendship. It was hard to guess. I've had this little item ready for months, but I also let you go. I'm that afraid. It looks like a seashell radio and something more. It listens. If you put it in your ear, Montag, I can sit comfortably home, warming my frightened bones, and hear and analyze the fireman's world. Find its weakness without danger. I'm the queen bee, safe in the hive. You will be the drone, the traveling ear. Eventually, I could put out ears into all parts of the city with various men listening and evaluating. If the drones die, I'm still safe at home, tending my fright with a maximum of comfort and a minimum of chance. See how safe I play it? How contemptible I am? Montag placed the green bullet in his ear. The old man inserted a similar object in his own ear and moved his lips. Montag, 
The voice was in Montag's head. I hear you. The old man laughed. You're coming over fine, too, Faber whispered, but in the voice in Montag's head was clear. Go to the firehouse when it's time. I'll be with you. Let's listen to this Captain Beatty together. He could be one of us. God knows. I'll give you things to say. We'll give him a good show. Do you hate me for this electronic cowardice of mine? Here I am sending you out into the night while I stay behind the lines with my damned ears listening for you to get your head chopped off. We all do what we do, said Montag. He put the Bible in the old man's hands. Here, I'll chance turning in a substitute tomorrow. I'll see the unemployed printer, yes. That much I can do. Good night, Professor. Not good night. I'll be with you the rest of the night. A vinegar gnat tickling your ear when you need me. But good night, and good luck anyway. The door opened and shut. Montag was in the dark street, again looking at the world. You could feel the war getting ready in the sky that night, the way the clouds moved aside and came back, and the way the stars looked, a million of them swimming between the clouds. Like the enemy disc and the feeling that the sky might fall upon the city and turn it to chalk dust and the moon go up in red fire. That was how the night fell. felt. Montag walked from the subway with the money in his pocket. He had visited the bank which was open all night every night with robot tellers in attendance and as he walked he was listening to the seashell radio in one ear. We have mobilized a million men. Quick victory is ours if the war comes. Music flooded over the voice quickly and it was gone. Ten million men mobilized. Faber's voice whispered in his other ear. But say one million. It's happier. Faber? Yes. I'm not thinking, I'm just doing like I'm told, like always. You said get the money and I got it. I didn't really think of it your, myself. When do I start working things out on my own? You've started already by saying what you just said. You'll have to take me on faith. I took the others on faith. Yes, and look where we're headed. You'll have to travel blind for a while. Here's my arm to hold on to. I don't want to change sides and just be told what to do. There's no reason to change if I do that. You're wise already. Montag felt his feet moving him on the sidewalk toward his house. Keep talking. Would you like me to read? I'll read so you can remember. I go to bed only five hours a night nothing to do so if you like I'll read you to sleep nights they say you retain knowledge even when you're sleeping if someone whispers it in your ear yes here far away across town in the night the faintest whisper of a turned page the book of Job the moon rose in the sky as Montag walked his lips moving just a trifle he was eating a light supper at nine in the evening when the front door cried out in the hall and Mildred ran from the parlor like a native fleeing an, an eruption of Vesuvius. Miss Phelps and Miss Boyles came through the front door and vanished into the volcano's mouth with martinis in their hands. Montag stopped, stopped eating. They were like a monstrous crystal chandelier tinkling in a thousand chimes. He saw their Cheshire cat smiles burning through the walls of the house, and now they were screaming at each other above the din. Montag found himself at the parlor door with his food still in his mouth. 
Doesn't everyone look nice? Nice. You look fine, Millie. Fine. Everyone looks swell. Swell. Montag stood watching them. Patience, whispered Faber. I shouldn't be here, whispered Montag, almost to himself. I should be on my way back to you with the money. Tomorrow's time enough. Careful. Isn't this show wonderful? cried Mildred. Wonderful. On one wall, a woman smiled and drank orange juice simultaneously. How does she do both at once? thought Montag insanely. In the other walls, an x-ray of the same woman revealed the contracting journey of the refreshing beverage on its way to her de delighted stomach. Abruptly, the room took off on a rocket flight into the clouds. It plunged into a lime green sea where blue fish are red and yellow fish. A minute later, three white cartoon clowns chopped off each other's limbs to the accompaniment of immense incoming tides of laughter. Two minutes more and the room wiped out of town to the jet cars widely circling an arena, bashing and backing up and bashing each other again. Montag saw a number of bodies fly in the air. Millie, did you see that? I saw it, I saw it! Montag reached inside the parlor wall and pulled the main switch. The images drained away as if the water had been let from a gigantic crystal bowl of hysterical fish. The three women turned slowly and looked with unconcealed irritation and then dislike at Montag. When do you suppose the war will start? He said. I notice your husbands aren't here tonight. Oh, they come and go, come and go. And Miss Phelps said Miss Phelps. And again, out again, Finnegan, the army called Pete yesterday. He'll be back next week. The army said so. Quick war. 48 hours, they said. And everyone home. That's what the army said. Quick war. Pete was called yesterday, and they said he'd be back next week. Quick. The three women fidgeted and looked nervously at the empty mud-colored walls. Addicts, y'all. They are all addicts. Mm. I'm not war I'm not worried, said Miss Phillips. Miss, excuse me, Miss Phelps. I'll let Pete do all the worrying, she giggled. I'll let old Pete do all the worrying. Not me. I'm not worried. It's always someone else's husband dies, they say. I've heard that too. I've never known any dead man killed in a war. Killed jumping off buildings, yes, like Gloria's husband last week. But from wars, no. Not from wars, said Miss Phelps. Anyway, Pete and I always said no tears, nothing like that. It's our third marriage each, and we're independent. Be independent, we always said. He said, if I get killed off, you just go right ahead and don't cry, but get married again, and don't think of me. That reminds me, said Mildred. Did you see that Clara Dove five-minute romance last night in your wall? Well, it was all about this woman who... Montag said nothing but stood looking at the, woman, the women's faces as he had once looked at the face of saints in a strange church. He had entered when he was a child. The faces of those enameled creatures meant nothing to him. Though he talked to them and stood in that church for a long time, trying to be of that religion, trying to know what that religion was, trying to get enough of the raw incense and special dust of the place into his lungs and thus into his blood, to feel touched and concerned by the meaning of the colorful men and women with the porcelain eyes and the blood ruby lips. But there was nothing, nothing. It was a stroll through another store and his currency strange and un 
usable there. And his passion cold, even when he touched the wood and plaster and clay. So it was now in his own parlor with these women twisting in their chairs under his gaze, lighting cigarettes, blowing smoke, touching their sun-fired hair, and examining their blazing fingernails as if they had caught fire from his look. Their faces grew haunted with silence. They leaned forward at the sound of Montag swallowing his final bite of food. They listened to his feverish breathing. The three empty walls of the room were like the pale brows of sleeping giants, now empty of dreams. Montag felt as if you touch these three staring brows, you would feel a fine salt sweat on your fingertips. The, perspire, the perspiration gathered with the silence and the subaudible trembling around and about and in the women who were burning with tension. Any moment they might hiss a long sputtering hiss and explode. Montag moved his lips. Let's talk. The women jerked and stared. How are your children, Miss Phelps? He asked. You know I haven't any. No one in his right mind, the good Lord knows, would have children, said Miss Phelps, not quite sure why she was angry with this man. I wouldn't say that, said Miss Ball, Miss Balls. Excuse me, Bowles. I've had two children by cesarean section or c-section no use going through all that agony for a baby the world must reproduce you know the race must go on besides they sometimes look just like you and that's nice two c-sections turn the trick yes sir oh my doctor said Cesareans aren't necessary. You've got the hips for it. Everything's normal, but I insisted. Cesareans or not, children are ruinous. You're out of your mind, said Miss Phelps. I plunked the children in school nine days out of ten. I put up with them when they come home three days a month. It's not bad at all. You have them into the parlor and turn the switch. It's like washing clothes. Stuff laundry in and slam the lid. Miss Bowles t tittered. They just as soon kick as kiss me. Thank God I can kick back. The women showed their tongues laughing. Mildred sat a moment and then, seeing that Montag was still in the doorway, clapped her hands. Let's talk politics to, p to please Guy. Sounds fine, says Bowles. I voted last election, same as everyone, and I laid it on the line for President Noble. I think he's one of the nicest looking men ever became president. Oh, but the man they ran against him. He wasn't much, was he? Kind of small and homely, and he didn't shave too close or comb his hair very well. He wasn't much, was he? Uh, ooh. What possessed the outs to run him? You just don't go running a little short man like that against a tall man. Besides, he mumbled. Half the time I couldn't hear a word he said, and the words I did hear I didn't understand. Fat, too, and didn't dress to hide it. No wonder the landslide was for Winston Noble. Even their names helped. Compare Winston Noble to Hubbard Hoeg for ten seconds, and you can almost figure the results. Damn it! cried Montag. What do you know about Hoig and Noble? Why, they were right in that parlor wall not six months ago. One was always picking his nose, 
It drove me wild. Well, Mr. Montag, said Miss Phelps, do you want us to vote for a man like that? Mildred beamed. You just run away from the door, guy, and don't make us nervous. But Montag was gone and back in a moment with a book in his hand. Guy! Damn it all, damn it all, damn it! What have you got there? Isn't that a book? I thought all special training these days was done by film. Miss Phelps blinked. You reading up on fireman theory? Theory? Hell, said Montag. It's poetry. Montag, a whisper. Leave me alone. Montag felt himself turning in a great circling roar and buzz and hum. Montag, hold on. Don't. Did you hear them? Did you hear these monsters talking about monsters? Oh, God, the way they jabber about people and their own children and themselves and the way they talk about their husbands and the way they talk about war. Damn it, I stand here and I can't believe it. I didn't say a single word about any war. I'll have you know, said Miss Phelps. As for poetry, I hate it, said Miss Bowles. Have you ever heard any? Have you? Montag, Faber's voice scrapped away at him. You'll ruin everything. Shut up, you fool. All three women were on their feet. Sit down, they sat. I'm going home, quavered Miss Bowles. Montag, Montag, please, in the name of God, what are you up to? pleaded Faber. Why don't you just read us one of those poems from your little books? Miss Phelps nodded. I think they'd be very interesting. That's not right, wailed Miss Bowles. We can't do that. Well, look at Mr. Montag. He wants to. I know he does. And if we listen nice, Mr. Montag will be happy. And then maybe we can go on and do something else. She glanced nervously at the long emptiness of the walls enclosing them. Montag, go through with this and I'll cut off. I'll, I'll leave the beetle jabbed his ear. What good is this? What'll you prove? Scare hell out of them? That's what. Scare the living daylights out. Mildred looked at the empty air. Now, Guy, just who are you talking to? A silver needle pierced his brain. Montag, listen, only one way out. Play it as a joke. Cover up. Pretend you aren't mad at all. Then walk to your wall incinerator and throw the book in. Mildred had already anticipated this in a quavery voice. Ladies, once a year, every fireman's allowed to bring one book home from the old days to show his family how silly it all was, how nervous that sort of thing can make you, how crazy. Guy's surprise tonight is to read you one sample to show how mixed up things were so none of us will ever have to bother our little old heads about that junk again. Isn't that right, darling? He crushed the book in his fist. Say yes. His mouth moved like Faber's. Yes. Mildred snatched the book with a laugh. <laughs> Here, read this one. No, I, I take it back. Here's that real funny one you read out loud today. Ladies, you won't understand a word. It goes umpty um, umpty dump dump. Go ahead, guy. That page clear. He looked at the open page. A fly stirred its wings softly in his rear in his ear. R read. What's the title, dear? Dover Beach. His mouth was numb. 
Now read in a nice clear voice and go slow. The room was blazing hot. He was all fire. He was all coldness. They sat in the middle of an empty desert with three chairs and him standing swaying and him waiting for Miss Phelps to stop straightening her dress hem and Miss Bowles to take her fingers away from her, from her hair. Then he began to read in a low, stumbling voice that grew firmer as he progressed from line to line, and his voice went out across the desert, into the whiteness, and around the three sitting women there in the great hot emptiness. The Sea of Faith Was once too at the full and round earth's shore, lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled but now i only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drearier and naked shingles of the world the chairs creaked under the three women montag finished it out ah love let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various so beautiful so new hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain and we are here as on a darkling pain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night miss phelps was crying the others in the middle of the de desert watched her crying grow very loud as her face squeezed itself out of shape they sat not touching her bewildered with her display she sobbed uncontrollably montag himself was stunned and shaken Shh said Mildred. You're all right, Clara. Now, Clara, snap out of it. Clara, what's wrong? I, I sobbed, Miss Phelps. Don't know, don't know, I just don't know. Oh, oh. Miss Bowles stood up and glared at Montag. You see, I knew it. That's what I wanted to prove. I knew it would happen. I've always said poetry and tears poetry and suicide and crying and awful feelings poetry and sickness all that mush now i've had it proved to me you're nasty mr montag you're nasty faber said now montag felt himself turn and walk to the wall slot and drop the book in through the brass notch to the waiting flames silly words silly words silly awful hurting words said miss balls why do people want to hurt people not enough hurt in the world you've got to tease people with stuff like that clara now clara begged mildred pulling her arm come on let's be cheery you turn the family on now Go ahead, let's pl let's laugh and be happy. Now stop crying, we'll have a party. No, said Miss Bowles, I'm trotting right straight home. You want to visit my house and my family? Well, and good. But I won't come in the fireman's crazy house again in my lifetime. Go home, Montag fi fixed his eyes upon her quietly. Go home and think of your first husband divorced and your second husband killed in a jet and your third husband blowing his brains out. Go home and think of the dozen abortions you've had. Go home and think of that and your damn Caesarean section. <laughs> Two, and your children who hate your guts. Go home and think how it all happened and what did you ever do to stop it. Go home. Go home, he yelled, before I knock you down and kick you out the door. Door slammed and the house was empty. 
Montag stood alone in the winter weather and the parlor walls the color of dirty snow. In the bathroom water ran, he heard Mildred shake the sleeping tablet into her hand. Fool, Montag. Fool, fool. Oh, God, you silly fool. Shut up. He pulled the green bullet from his ear and jammed it into his pocket. It sizzled faintly. Fool. Fool. He searched the house and found the books where Mildred had stacked them behind the refrigerator. Some were missing and he knew that she had started on her own slow process of dispersing the dynamite in her house, stick by stick. But he was not angry now, only exhausted and bewildered with himself. He carried the books into the backyard and hid them in the bushes near the alley fence. For tonight only he thought in case she decides to do any more burning. He went back through the house. Mildred, he called at the door of the darkened bedroom. There was no sound. Outside crossing the lawn on his way to work, he tried not to see how completely dark and deserted Clarice McLean's house was. On the way downtown, he was so completely alone with his terrible error that he felt the necessity for the strange warmness and goodness that came from a familiar and gentle voice speaking in the night already in a few short hours. It seemed that he had known Faber for a lifetime. Now he knew that he was two people, that he was above all. Montag knew, who knew, nothing who did not even know himself a fool, but only suspected it. And he knew that he was also the old man who talked to him, and talked to him as the train was sucked from one end of the night city to the other on, the, on one long, sickening gasp of motion. In the days to follow, in the nights when there was no moon, and in the nights when there was a very bright moon shining on the earth, the old man would go on with his talk, with this talking and this talking drop by drop, stone by stone, flake by flake, his mind would well over at last and he would not be Montag anymore. This the old man told him, assured him, promised him he would be Montag plus Faber, fire plus water, and then one day, after everything had mixed and simmered and worked away in silence, there would be neither fire nor water but wine. Out of two separate and opposite things, a third, and one day he would look back upon the fool and know the fool. Even now he could feel the start of the long journey, the leave taking, the going away from the self he had been. It was good listening to the beetle hum, the sleepy mosquito buzz, and delicate filigree murmur of the old man's voice at first scolding him and then consoling him in the late hour of night as he emerged from the steaming subway toward the firehouse swirl. Pity, Montag, pity. Don't haggle and nag them. You were so recently of them yourself. They are so confident that they will run that they will run on forever, but they won't run on. They don't know that this is all one huge big blazing meteor that makes a pretty fire in space, but that someday it'll have to hit. They see only the blaze, the pretty fire, as you saw it. And we will stop there for today. Man, what what a read right guys oh <sighs> but doesn't that sound like our world today too it seems like in the world of montags feelings and emotions are gone miss boyles told told the ladies that poetry was used to harm but what do you think poetry means now? And then what they talked about children, going back to their conversation about children, sounds like how we see children today. I mean, not too long ago, I saw an article about, and a video about uh, the joys of not having children. <laughs> I 
I mean, and then there we have like all these methods of raising kids, co-parenting, and of course the biggie that I will not talk about that you already know, just killing children all together. You already know what that's called. I don't need to address it. But how close is the world of Montax as close to this one? Imagine, and then going back to the Bible, which um, Montag is going to have Faber, they're going to secretly copy. Imagine a world where there was no more Bibles anymore and you had, or any books at all. Imagine you, it was illegal to copy any scripture, any passages. Just imagine that. I couldn't. And that's why I said earlier, not earlier, I'm sorry, last time we talked why the people of God need to know they were, because who knows when it'll be taken away. And once again, these ladies, they're addicts, they're screen addicts. Every time it, the TV goes off, they have an itch or they sweat. They're addicts. Mildred's an addict. And once again, right after her friends left and she was upset and she reached for the sleeping pill bottle. I mean, I'm sorry, there's a glare right now, but. I want you to think about this before we leave tonight. How close are we to really being like this world? Of this world in Fahrenheit 451? Are we there yet? Are we just about there? Or, nah, we're not there. I mean, this is fiction, right? But how close is fiction to reality? Also, I want you to think about this. Yes, we have ebooks now, but how does how do books affect you when you read them? Are books really that powerful? Is this right here, this hard cover, well actually it's paperback, but this physical item how does it affect you? Does it teach? Does it preach? Does it entertain? Also, I want to leave you with this. Would you stand? There was a passage from yesterday when Mildred was saying, are you going to choose that Bible or me? I feel like we're coming to the precipice of Will we stand for God in this last day? Because it is the last day. Will we stand? Or will we be like Faber and just let things happen? You let me know. So until next time, this is Miss Petals. And remember, a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. I'll see you all Monday at 6.